This is from my podcast, Down to Sleep, where I read books to help you get a good night's rest. You can listen for free here, Spotify, or other apps. Come and support the podcast on Patreon and get a bonus episode every single week, as well as vote on what book I read next. Hit like and subscribe, and enjoy. So let's go ahead and dive in with The Little Mermaid. Far out in the ocean. The water is as blue as the petals of the loveliest cornflower, and as clear as the purest glass. But it is very deep, too. It goes down deeper than any anchor rope will go, and many, many steeples would have to be stacked, one on top of another, to reach the bottom to the surface of the sea. It is down there, that the sea folk live. Now, don't suppose that there are only bare white sands at the bottom of the sea. No, indeed. The most marvellous trees and flowers grow down there, with such pliant stalks and leaves that the least stir in the water makes them move about as though they were alive. All sorts of fish, large and small, dart among the branches just as birds would flit through the trees up here. From the deepest spot in the ocean rises the palace of the Sea King. Its walls are made of coral, and its high-pointed windows of the clearest amber. But the roof is made of mussel shells that open and shut with the tide. This is a wonderful sight to see, for every shell holds glistening pearls, any one of which would be the pride of a queen's crown. The sea king down there had been a widower for years, and his old mother kept house for him. She was a clever woman, but very proud of her noble birth. Therefore she flaunted twelve oysters on her tail, while the other ladies of the court were only allowed to wear six. Except for this, she was an altogether praiseworthy person, particularly so because she was extremely fond of her granddaughters, the little sea princesses. They were six lovely girls, but the youngest was the most beautiful of them all. Her skin was as soft and tender as a rose petal, and her eyes were as blue as the deep sea. But like all the others, she had no feet. Her body ended in a fishtail. The whole day long they used to play in the palace, down in the great halls where live flowers grew on the walls. Whenever the high amber windows were thrown open, the fish would swim in, just as swallows dart into our rooms when we open the windows. But these fish, now, would swim right up to the little princesses to eat out of their hands, and let themselves be petted. Outside the palace was a big garden, with flaming red and deep blue trees, Their fruit glittered like gold, and their blossoms flamed like fire on their constantly waving stalks. The soil was very fine sand indeed, but as blue as burning brimstone. A strange blue veil lay over everything down there. You would have thought yourself aloft in the air, with only the blue sky above and beneath you, rather than down at the bottom of the sea. When there was a dead calm, you could just see the sun, like a scarlet flower with light streaming from its calyx. Each little princess had her own small garden plot, where she could dig and plant whatever she liked. One of them made her little flower bed in the shape 
of a whale. Another thought it neater to shape hers like a little mermaid. But the youngest of them made hers as round as the sun. And there she only grew flowers which were as red as the sun itself. She was an unusual child, quiet and wistful. And when her sisters decorated their gardens with all kinds of odd things that they had found in sunken ships, she would allow nothing in hers except flowers as red as the sun and a pretty marble statue. This figure of a handsome boy, carved in pure white marble, it had sunk down to the bottom of the sea from some ship that was wrecked. Beside the statue she planted a rose-colored weeping willow tree, which thrived so well that its graceful branches shaded the statue and hung down to the blue sand, where their shadows took on a violet tint and swayed as the branches swayed. It looked as if the roots and the tips of the branches were kissing each other in play. Nothing gave the youngest princess such pleasure as to hear about the world of human beings up above them. Her old grandmother had to tell her all she knew about ships and cities, of people and animals. What seemed nicest of all to her was that up on land the flowers were fragrant, for those at the bottom of the sea had no scent. And she thought it was nice that the woods were green, and that the fish that you saw among their branches could sing so loud and sweet that it was delightful to hear them. Her grandmother had to call the little birds fish, or the princess would not have known what she was talking about, for she had never seen a bird. When you get to be fifteen, her grandmother said, you will be allowed to rise up out of the ocean and sit on the rocks in the moonlight to watch the great ships sailing by. You will see woods and towns too. Next year, one of her sisters would be fifteen, but the others, well, since each was a whole year older than the next, the youngest still had five long years to wait until she could rise up from the water and see what our world was like. But each sister promised to tell the others about all that she saw and what she found most marvellous on her first day. Their grandmother had not told them half enough, and there were so many things that they longed to know about. The most eager of them all was the youngest, the very one who was so quiet and wistful. Many a night she stood by her open window and looked up through the dark blue water where the fish waved their fins and tails. She could just see the moon and the stars. To be sure, their light was quite dim, but looked at through the water, they seemed much bigger than they appear to us. Whenever a cloud-like shadow swept across them, she knew that it was either a whale swimming overhead, or a ship with many human beings aboard. Little did they dream that a pretty young mermaid was down below, stretching her white arms up towards the keel of their ship. The eldest princess had her fifteenth birthday, so now she received permission to rise up out of the water. When she got back, she had a hundred things to tell her sisters about, but the most marvellous thing of all, she said, was to lie on a sandbar in the moonlight, when the sea was calm, 
and to gaze at the large city on the shore, where the lights twinkled like hundreds of stars, to listen to music, to hear the chatter and clamour of carriages and people, to see so many church towers and spires, to hear the ringing bells. Because she could not enter the city, that was just what she most dearly longed to do. Oh, how intently the youngest sister listened. After this, whenever she stood at her open window at night and looked up through the dark blue waters, she thought of that great city with its clatter and clamour, and even fancied that in these depths she could hear the church bells ring. The next year, her second sister had permission to rise up to the surface and swim wherever she pleased. She came up just at sunset, and she said that this spectacle was the most marvellous sight that she had ever seen. The heavens had a golden glow, and as for the clouds, she could not find words to describe their beauty splashed with red and tinted with violet, they sailed over her head. But much faster than the sailing clouds were wild swans in a flock, like a long white veil trailing above the sea. They flew towards the sun. She too swam toward it, but down it went, and all the rose-coloured glow faded from the sea and the sky. The following year, her third sister ascended, and as she was the boldest of them all, she swam up a broad river that flowed into the ocean. She saw gloriously green, vine-coloured hills. Palaces and manor houses could be glimpsed through the splendid woods. She heard all the birds sing, and the sun shone so brightly that often she had to dive under the water to cool her burning face. In a small cove she found a whole school of mortal children paddling about in the water naked. She wanted to play with them, but they took fright and ran away. Then along came a little black animal. It was a dog, but she had never seen a dog before. It barked at her so ferociously that she took fright herself and fled to the open sea. But never could she forget the splendid woods, the green hills, and the nice children who could swim in the water, although they didn't wear fishtails. The fourth sister was not so venturesome. She stayed far out among the rough waves, which she said was a marvellous place. You could see all around you for miles and miles, and the heavens up above you were like a vast dome of glass. She had seen ships, but they were so far away that they looked like seagulls. Playful dolphins had turned somersaults, and monstrous whales had spouted water through their nostrils, so that it looked as if hundreds of fountains were playing all around them. Now the fifth sister had her turn. Her birthday came in the winter time, so she saw things that none of the others had seen. The sea was a deep green colour, and enormous icebergs drifted about. Each one glistened like a pearl. But they were more lofty than any church steeple built by man. They assumed the most fantastic shapes and sparkled like diamonds. She had seated herself on the largest one, and all the ships that came sailing by sped away as soon as the frightened sailors saw her there, 
with her long hair blowing in the wind. In the late evening, clouds filled the sky. Thunder cracked and lightning darted across the heavens. Black waves lifted those great bergs of ice on high where they flashed when the lightning struck. On all the ships, the sails were reefed. There was fear and trembling. But quietly she sat there upon her drifting iceberg and watched the blue forked lightning strike the sea. Each of the sisters took delight in the lovely new sights when she first rose up to the surface of the sea. But when they became grown-up girls who were allowed to go wherever they liked, they became indifferent to it. They would become homesick, and in a month they said there was no place like the bottom of the sea where they felt so completely at home. On many an evening the older sisters would rise to the surface arm in arm, all five in a row. They had beautiful voices, more charming than any of those mortal beings. When a storm was brewing and they anticipated a shipwreck, they would swim before the ship and sing, most seductively, of how beautiful it was at the bottom of the ocean, trying to overcome the prejudice that the sailors had against coming down to them. But people could not understand their song, and mistook it for the voice of the storm. Nor was it for them to see the glories of the deep. When their ship went down, they were drowned, and it was as dead men that they reached the Sea King's palace. On the evenings when the mermaids rose through the water like this, arm in arm, their youngest sister stayed behind, all alone, looking after them, wanting to weep. But a mermaid has no tears, and therefore she suffers so much more. Oh, how I do wish I were fifteen, she said. I know I shall love that world up there, and all the people who live in it. And at last, she too came to fifteen. Now I'll have you off my hands, said her grandmother. Come, let me adorn you like your sisters. In the little maid's hair she put a wreath of white lilies, each petal which was formed from the half of a pearl, and the old queen let eight big oysters fasten themselves to the princess's tail as a sign of her high rank. But that hurts, said the little mermaid. You must put up with a good deal to keep up appearances, her grandmother told her. Oh, how gladly she would have shaken off all of these decorations and laid aside the cumbersome wreath. The red flowers in her garden were much more becoming to her, but she didn't dare to make any changes. Goodbye, she said and up she went through the water, as light and as sparkling as a bubble. The sun had just gone down when her head rose above the surface, but the clouds still shone like gold and roses, and in the delicately tinted sky sparkled the clear gleam of an evening star. The air was mild and fresh, and the sea unruffled. A great three-master lay in view, with only one of its sails set, for there was not even the whisper of a breeze. The sailors idled about in the rigging and on the yards. There was music and singing on the ship, and as night came, on they lighted hundreds of such brightly colored lanterns that one might have thought the flags of all nations were swinging in the air. 
The little mermaid swam right up to the window of the main cabin, and each time she rose with the swell she could peep in through the clear glass panes, looking at the crowd of brilliantly dressed people within. The handsomest of them all was a young prince with big dark eyes. He could not be more than sixteen years old. It was his birthday, and that was the reason for all the celebration. Up on deck the sailors were dancing, and when the prince appeared among them, a hundred or more rockets flew through the air, making it as bright as day. These startled the little mermaid so badly that she ducked under the water, but she soon peeped up again and then it seemed as if all the stars in the sky were falling around her. Never had she seen such fireworks. Great suns spun around, splendid firefish floated through blue air, and all of these things were mirrored in the crystal clear sea. It was so brilliantly bright that she could see every little rope of the ship, and the people could be seen distinctly. Oh, how handsome the young prince was. He laughed, and he smiled, and shook people by the hand, while the music rang out in the perfect evening. It got very late, but the little mermaid could not take her eyes off of the ship and the handsome prince. The brightly colored lanterns were put out, no more rockets flew through the air. No more cannon boomed. But there was a mutter and rumble deep down in the sea, and the swell kept bouncing her up so high that she could look into the cabin. Now the ship began to sail. Canvas after canvas was spread in the wind. The waves rose high, great clouds gathered, lightning flashed in the distance. They were in for a terrible storm, and the mariners made haste to reef the sails. The tall ship pitched and rolled as it sped through the angry sea. The waves rose up like towering black mountains, as if they would break over the masthead. But the swan-like ship plunged into the valleys between such waves and emerged to ride their lofty heights. To the little mermaid this seemed like good sport, but to the sailors it was nothing of the sort. The ship creaked and labored, thick timbers gave way under heavy blows, waves broke over the ship. The main mast snapped in two like a reed. The ship listed over on its side, and water burst into the hold. Now the little mermaid saw that people were in peril, and that she herself must take care to avoid the beams and the wreckage tossed about by the sea. One moment it would be black as pitch, and she couldn't see a thing. Next moment the lightning would flash so brightly that she could distinguish every soul on board. Everyone was looking out for himself as best he could. She watched closely for the young prince, and when the ship split in two she saw him sink down in the sea. At first she was overjoyed that he would be with her, but then she recalled that human people could not live under the water, and he could only visit her father's palace as a dead man. No, he should not die. So she swam in among all the floating planks and beams, completely forgetting that they might crush her. She dived through the waves and 
rode their crests until at length she reached the young prince. He was no longer able to swim in that raging sea. His arms and legs were exhausted. His beautiful eyes were closing, and he would have died if the little mermaid had not come to help him. She held his head above water and let the waves take them wherever the waves went. At daybreak, when the storm was over, not a trace of the ship was in view. The sun rose out of the waters red and bright, and its beams seemed to bring the glow of life back to the cheeks of the prince. His eyes remained closed. The mermaid kissed his high and shapely forehead. As she stroked his wet hair in place, it seemed to her that he looked just like that marble statue in her little garden. She kissed him again and hoped that he would live. She saw dry land rise before her in high blue mountains, topped with snow as glistening white as if a flock of swans were resting there. Down by the shore were splendid green woods, and in the foreground stood a church or perhaps a convent. She didn't know which, but anyway it was a building. Orange and lemon trees grew in its garden, and tall palm trees grew besides the gateway. Here the sea formed a little harbour, quite calm and very deep. Fine white sand had been washed up below the cliffs. She swam there with the handsome prince and stretched him out on the sand taking special care to pillow his head up high in warm sunlight. The bells began to ring in the great white building, and a number of young girls came out into the garden. The little mermaid swam away behind some tall rocks that stuck out of the water. She covered her hair and her shoulders with foam so that no one could see her, tiny face, and then she watched to see who would find the poor prince. In a little while one of the girls came upon him. She seemed frightened, but only for a minute, and then she called for more people. The mermaid watched the prince regain consciousness and smile at everyone around him. But he did not smile at her, for he did not even know that she had saved him. She felt very unhappy. And when they led him away to the big building, she dived sadly down into the water and returned to her father's palace. She had always been quiet and wistful and now she became much more so. Her sisters asked her what she had seen on her first visit up to the surface, but she would not tell them a thing. Many evenings and many mornings she revisited the spot where she had left the prince. She saw the fruit in the garden ripened and harvested, and she saw the snow on the high mountain melted away, but she did not see the prince, so each time she came home sadder than she had left. It was her one consolation to sit in her little garden, throw her arms about the beautiful marble statue that looked so much like the prince. But she took no care of her flowers now. They overgrew the paths until the place was a wilderness and their long stalks and leaves became so entangled in the branches of the tree that it cast a gloomy shade. 
Finally, she couldn't bear it any longer. She told her secret to one of her sisters. Immediately, all the other sisters heard about it. No one else knew, except a few more mermaids who told no one, except their most intimate friends. One of these friends knew who the prince was. She too had seen the birthday celebration on the ship. She knew where he came from, and where his kingdom was. Come, little sister, said the other princesses. Arm in arm they rose from the water in a long row, right in front of where they knew the prince's palace stood. It was built of pale, glistening golden stone, with great marble staircases, one of which led down to the sea. Magnificent gilt domes rose above the roof, and between the pillars all around the building were marble statues that looked most lifelike. Through the clear glass of the lofty windows, one could see into the splendid halls, with their costly silk hangings and tapestries, walls covered with paintings that were delightful to behold. In the center of the main hall, a large fountain played its columns of spray up to the glass-domed roof, through which the sun shone down on the water and upon the lovely plants that grew in the big basin. Now that she knew where he lived, many an evening and many a night she spent there in the sea. She swam much closer to shore than any of her sisters would dare venture and she even went up a narrow stream under the splendid marble balcony that cast its long shadow in the water. Here she used to sit and watch the young prince when he thought himself quite alone in the bright moonlight. On many evenings she saw him sail out in his fine boat, with music playing and flags a-flutter. She would peep out through the green rushes, and if the wind blew her long silver veil, anyone who saw it mistook her for a swan spreading its wings. On many nights she saw the fishermen come out to the sea with their torches, heard them tell about how kind the young prince was. This made her proud to think that it was she who had saved his life when he was buffeted about, half dead among the waves. She thought of how softly his head had rested on her breast, how tenderly she had kissed him. Though he knew nothing of all of this, nor could he even dream of it, Increasingly, she grew to like human beings. More and more, she longed to live among them. Their world seemed so much wider than her own. They could skim over the sea in ships and mount up into the lofty peaks high over the clouds. Their lands stretched out in woods and fields farther than the eye could see. There was so much that she wanted to know. Her sisters could not answer all her questions, so she asked her old grandmother, who knew about the upper world, which was what she said was the right name for the countries above the sea. If men aren't drowned, the little mermaid asked, do they live on forever? Don't they die as, as we do down here in the sea? Yes, the old lady said, they too must die, and their lifetimes are even shorter than ours. We can live to be three hundred years old. When we perish, we turn into mere foam on the sea, and haven't even a grave down here among our dear ones. We have no immortal soul, no life hereafter. We are like the green seaweed, once cut down, it never grows again. Human beings, on the contrary, have a soul which lives forever. Long after their bodies have turned to clay, 
it rises through thin air up to the shining stars. Just as we rise through the water to see the lands on earth, so men rise up to beautiful places unknown, which we shall never see. Why weren't we given an immortal soul? The little mermaid sadly asked. I would gladly give up three hundred years if I could be a human being only for a day, and later share in that heavenly realm. You must not think about that, said the old lady. We fare much more happily and are much better off than the folk up there. Then I must also die and float as foam upon the sea, not hearing the music of the waves and seeing neither the beautiful flowers nor the red sun. Can't I do anything at all to win an immortal soul? No, her grandmother answered. Not unless... A human being loved you so much that you meant more to him than his father and mother, if his every thought and his whole heart cleaved to you, so that he would let a priest join his right hand to yours and would promise to be faithful here and throughout all eternity. Then his soul would dwell in your body and you would share in the happiness of mankind. He would give you a soul and yet keep his own. But that can never come to pass. The very thing that is your greatest beauty here in the sea, your fishtail, would be considered ugly on land. They have such poor taste that to be thought beautiful there you have to have two awkward props which they call legs. The little mermaid sighed and looked unhappily at her fishtail. Come, let us be gay, the old lady said. Let us leap and bound throughout the three hundred years that we have to live. Surely that is time and to spare, and afterwards we shall be glad enough to rest in our graves. We are holding a court ball this evening. This was a much more glorious affair than is ever to be seen on earth. The walls and the ceiling of the great ballroom were made of massive but transparent glass. Many hundreds of huge rose-red and grass-green shells stood on each side in rows, with the blue flames that burned in each shell, illuminating the whole room and shining through the walls so clearly that it was quite bright in the sea outside. You could see the countless fish, great and small, swimming towards the glass walls. On some of them the scales gleamed purplish red, while others were silver and gold. Across the floor of the hall ran a wide stream of water, and upon this the mermaids and the mermen danced to their entrancing songs. Such beautiful voices are not to be heard among the people who live on land. The little mermaid sang more sweetly than anyone else, and everyone applauded her. For a moment her heart was happy, because she knew that she had the loveliest voice of all in the sea, or on the land. But her thoughts soon strayed to the world up above. She could not forget the charming prince, nor her sorrow that she did not have an immortal soul like his. Therefore she stole out of her father's palace, and while everything there was song and gladness, she sat sadly, in her own little garden. Then she heard a bugle call through the water, and she thought, that must mean he is sailing up there. He whom I love more than my father or mother, he of whom I am always thinking, and in whose hands I would so willingly trust my lifelong happiness. I dare do anything to win him and to gain an immortal soul. While my sisters are dancing here in my father's palace, 
I shall visit the sea witch, of whom I have always been so afraid. Perhaps she will advise me and help me. The little mermaid set out from her garden toward the whirlpools that raged in front of the witch's dwelling. She had never gone that way before, no flowers grew there, nor any seaweed. Bare and grey, the sands extended to the whirlpools, where like roaring mill wheels the waters whirled and snatched everything within their reach, down to the bottom of the sea. Between these tumultuous whirlpools she had to thread her way to reach the witch's waters. And then for a long stretch the only trail lay through a hot, seething mire, which the witch called her peat marsh. Beyond it lay her house, in the middle of a weird forest. All the trees and the shrubs were polyps, half animal, half plant. They looked like hundred-headed snakes growing out of the soil. All their branches were long, slimy arms, with fingers like wriggling worms. They squirmed, joint by joint, from their roots to their outermost tentacles. Whatever they could lay hold of, they twined around and they never let go. The little mermaid was terrified and stopped at the edge of the forest. Her heart thumped with fear, and she nearly turned back. But then she remembered the prince and the souls that men have, and she summoned her courage. She bound her long flowing locks closely about her head so the polyps could not catch hold of them, folded her arms across her breast, and darted through the water like a fish, in among the slimy polyps that stretched out their writhing arms and fingers to seize her. She saw that every one of them held something that it had caught with its hundreds of little tentacles, and to which it clung as with strong hoops of steel. The white bones of men who had perished at sea and sunk to these depths could be seen in the polyps' arms. Ships' rudders, seamen's chests, the skeletons of land animals who had fallen into their clutches. But the most ghastly sight of all was a little mermaid whom they had caught and strangled. She reached a large muddy clearing in the forest where big fat water snakes slithered about, showing their foul yellowish bellies in the middle of this clearing was a house built of the bones of shipwrecked men, and there sat the sea witch, letting a toad eat out of her mouth, just as we might feed sugar to a little canary bird. She called the ugly fat water snakes her little chickabiddies, and let them crawl and sprawl about on her spongy bosom. I know exactly what you want, said the sea witch. It is very foolish of you, but just the same you shall have your way. For it will bring you to grief, my proud princess. You want to get rid of your fish tail and have two props instead, so that you can walk about like a human creature and have the young prince fall in love with you win him, and an immortal soul besides. At this the witch gave such a loud, cackling laugh that the toad and the snakes were shaken to the ground, where they lay, writhing. You are just in time, said the witch. 
after the sun comes up tomorrow. A whole year would have to go by before I could be of any help to you. I shall compound you a draught, and before sunrise you must swim to the shore with it. Seat yourself on dry land and drink the draught down. Then your tail will divide and shrink until it becomes what the people on earth call a pair of shapely legs. But it will hurt. It will feel as if a sharp sword slashed through you. Everyone who sees you will say that you are the most graceful human being that they have ever laid eyes on. For you will keep your gliding movement. And no dancer will be able to tread as lightly as you. But every step you take will feel as if you were treading upon knife blades, so sharp that blood must flow. I am willing to help you, but are you willing to suffer all this? Yes, the little mermaid replied in a trembling voice, as she thought of the prince and gaining a human soul. Remember, said the witch, once you have taken a human form, you can never be a mermaid again. You can never come back through the waters to your sisters or to your father's palace. And if you do not win the love of the prince so completely that for your sake he forgets his father and mother, cleaves to you with his every thought and his whole heart, and lets the priest join your hands in marriage, then you will win no immortal soul. If he marries someone else, your heart will break on the very next morning, and you will become foam of the sea. I shall take that risk, said the little mermaid, but she turned as pale as death. Also you will have to pay me, said the witch, and it is no trifling price that I'm asking. You have the sweetest voice of anyone down here at the bottom of the sea. And while I don't doubt that you would like to captivate the prince with it, you must give this voice to me. I will take the very best thing that you have in return for my sovereign draught. I must pour my own blood into it to make the drink as sharp as a two-edged sword. But if you take my voice, said the little mermaid, what will be left of me? Your lovely form, the witch told her, your gliding movements, your eloquent eyes, with these you can easily enchant a human heart. Well, have you lost your courage? Stick out your little tongue and I shall cut it off. I'll have my price, and you shall have the potent draught. Go ahead, said the little mermaid. The witch hung her cauldron over the flames to brew the draught. Cleanliness is a good thing, she said, as she tied her snakes in a knot and scoured out the pot with them. She pricked herself in the chest and let her black blood splash into the cauldron. Steam swelled up from it, in such ghastly shapes that anyone would have been terrified by them. The witch constantly threw in new ingredients into the cauldron, and it started to boil with a sound like that of a crocodile shedding tears. When the draught was ready at last, it looked as clear as the purest water. There's your draught, said the witch, and she cut off the tongue of the little mermaid, who now was dumb and could neither sing nor talk. If the polyps should pounce on you when you walk back through my wood, the witch said, just spill a drop of this brew upon them and their tentacles will break into a thousand pieces. 
but there was no need for that. The polyps curled up in terror as soon as they saw the bright draught. It glittered in the little mermaid's hands as if it were a shining star. So she soon traversed the forest, the marsh, and the place of raging whirlpools. She could see her father's palace. The lights had been snuffed out in the great ballroom, and doubtless everyone in the palace was asleep. She dared not go near them. Now that she was stricken dumb and was leaving her home forever, her heart felt as if it would break with grief. She tiptoed into the garden, took one flower from each of her sister's little plots, blew a thousand kisses towards the palace, and then mounted up through the dark blue sea. The sun had not yet risen when she saw the prince's palace. As she climbed his splendid marble staircase, the moon was shining clear. The little mermaid swallowed the bitter, fiery draught, and it was as if a two-edged sword struck through her frail body. She swooned away and lay there as if she were dead. When the sun rose over the sea, she awoke and felt a flash of pain. But directly in front of her stood the handsome young prince, gazing at her with his coal black eyes. Lowering her gaze, she saw her fishtail was gone, and she had the loveliest pair of white legs that any young maid could hope to have. She was naked, so she clothed herself in her own long hair. The prince asked who she was, how she came to be there. Her deep blue eyes looked at him tenderly, but very sadly, for she could not speak. He took her hand and led her into his palace. Every footstep felt as if she were walking on the blades and the points of sharp knives. She gladly endured it. She moved as lightly as a bubble as she walked beside the prince. He and all who saw her marveled at the grace of her gliding walk. Once clad in the rich silk and muslin garments that were provided for her, she was the loveliest person in all the palace, though she was dumb and could neither sing nor speak. Beautiful slaves attired in silk and cloth of gold came to sing before the prince and his royal parents. One of them sang more sweetly than all of the others, and when the prince smiled at her and clapped his hands, the little mermaid felt very unhappy, for she knew that she herself could sing much more sweetly. She thought, if only he knew that I parted with my voice forever so I could be near him. Graceful slaves began to dance to the most wonderful music, and the little mermaid lifted her shapely white arms. She rose up on the tips of her toes and skimmed over the floor. No one had ever danced so well. Each movement set off her beauty to a better and better advantage. Her eyes spoke more directly to the heart than any of the singers could do. She charmed everyone, and especially the prince who called her his dear little foundling. She danced time and time again, and though every time she touched the floor she felt as if she were treading on a sharp-edged steel. The prince said he would keep her with him always, that she was to have a velvet pillow to sleep on outside his door. He had a page's suit made for her, so she could go with him on horseback. 
They would ride through the sweet-scented woods, where the green boughs brushed her shoulders, where little birds sang among the fluttering leaves. She climbed up high mountains with the prince, and though her tender feet bled so that all could see it, she only laughed and followed him on until they could see clouds driving far below, like a flock of birds in flight to a distant land. At home in the prince's palace, while the others slept at night, she would go down the broad marble steps to cool her burning feet in the cold sea water. She would recall those who lived beneath the sea. One night, her sisters came by, arm in arm singing sadly as they breasted the waves. When she held out her hands towards them, they knew who she was, and told her how unhappy she had made them all. They came to see her every night after that, and once, far, far out to sea, she saw her old grandmother, who had not been up to the surface this many a year. With her was the sea king, with his crown upon his head. They stretched out their hands to her, but they did not venture so near to the land as her sisters had. Day after day she became more dear to the prince, who loved her as one would love a good little child, but he never thought of making her his queen. Yet she had to be his wife, or she would never have an immortal soul and on the morning after his wedding she would turn into foam on the waves. Don't you love me best of all? The little mermaid's eyes seemed to question him when he took her in his arms and kissed her lovely forehead. Yes, you are most dear to me, said the prince, for you have the kindest heart. You love me more than anyone else does, and you look so much like a young girl that I once saw, but she'll never find again. I was on a ship that was wrecked, and the waves cast me ashore near a holy temple, where many young girls performed the rituals. The youngest of them found me beside the sea, and saved my life. Though I saw her no more than twice, she is the only person in all the world whom I could love. But you are so much like her that you almost replace the memory of her in my heart. She belongs to that holy temple. Therefore it's my good fortune that I have you. We shall never part. Alas, he doesn't know it was I who saved his life, the little mermaid thought. I carried him over the sea to the garden, where the temple stands. I hid behind the foam, and watched to see if anyone would come. I saw the pretty maid that he loves better than me. A sigh was the only sign of her deep distress, for a mermaid cannot cry. He says that the other maid belongs to the holy temple. She will never come out into the world so they will never see each other again. It is I who will care for him, love him, and give all of my life to him. Now rumours arose that the prince was to wed the beautiful daughter of a neighbouring king, and that it was for this reason he was having such a superb ship made ready to sail. The rumour ran that the prince's real interest in visiting this neighbouring kingdom was to see the king's daughter, and that he was to travel with a lordly retinue. The little mermaid shook her head and smiled, for she knew the prince's thoughts better than anyone else did. 
I am forced to make this journey, he told her. I must visit the beautiful princess, for that is my parents' wish. But they would not have me bring her home as my bride against my own will. I can never love her. She does not resemble the maiden in the temple, as you do. And if I were to choose a bride, I would sooner choose you, my dear mute foundling, with those telling eyes of yours. And he kissed her on the mouth, fingered her long hair, and laid his head against her heart, so that she came to dream of mortal happiness and an immortal soul. I trust you aren't afraid of the sea, my silent child, he said, as they boarded the magnificent vessel that was to carry them to the land of the neighboring king. He told her stories of storms, of ships becalmed, of strange deep sea fish, of the wonders that the divers have seen. She smiled at such stories, for no one knew about the bottom of the sea as well as she did. In the clear moonlight, when everyone except the man at the helm was asleep, she sat on the side of the ship, gazing down through the transparent water. She fancied that she could catch glimpses of her father's palace, on the topmost tower stood her old grandmother, wearing her silver crown and looking up at the keel of the ship through the rushing waves. Her sisters rose to the surface, looked at her sadly and wrung their white hands. She smiled and waved, trying to let them know that all went well and she was happy. But along came the cabin boy, and her sisters dived out of sight so quickly that the boy supposed the flash of light was just foam on the sea. The next morning the ship came in to harbour of the neighbouring king's glorious city. All the church bells chimed, and trumpets were sounded from all the high towers while soldiers lined up with flying banners and glittering bayonets. Every day had a new festivity, as one ball followed another, but the princess was still to appear. They said she was being brought up in some faraway sacred temple, where she was learning every royal virtue. But she came at last. The little mermaid was curious to see how beautiful this princess was, and she had to grant that a more exquisite figure she had never seen. The princess's skin was clear and fair, and behind long dark lashes her deep blue eyes were smiling and devoted. It was you, the prince cried. You were the one who saved me. When I lay like a dead man beside the sea, he clasped the blushing bride of his choice in his arms. Oh, I am happier than a man should be, he told his little mermaid. My fondest dream, that which I never dared to hope, has come true. You will share in my great joy, for you love me more than anyone does. The little mermaid kissed his hand and felt her heart was beginning to break. For the morning after his wedding day would see her dead and turn to watery foam. All the church bells rang out. Heralds rode through the streets to announce the wedding. Upon every altar sweet-scented oils were burned in costly silver lamps. The priests swung their censers the bride and the bridegroom joined their hands, and the bishop blessed their marriage. The little mermaid, clothed in silk and cloth of gold, held the bride's train. 
She was deaf to the wedding march and blind to the holy ritual. Her thought turned on her last night upon earth, on all that she had lost in this world. That same evening, the bride and bridegroom went aboard the ship. Cannon thundered and banners waved. On the deck of the ship, a royal pavilion of purple and gold was set up, furnished with luxurious cushions. Here the wedded couple were to sleep on that calm, clear night. The sails swelled in the breeze, and the ship glided so lightly that it scarcely seemed to move over a quiet sea. The little mermaid could not forget the first time that she rose from the depths of the sea and looked on at such pomp and happiness. Light as a swallow pursued by his enemies, she joined in a whirling dance. Everyone cheered her, for never had she danced so wonderfully. Her tender feet felt as if they were pierced by daggers. But she did not feel it. Her heart suffered far greater pain. She knew that this was the last evening that she would ever see him, for whom she had forsaken her home and family, for whom she had sacrificed her lovely voice and suffered such constant torment, while he knew nothing of these things. It was the last night that she would breathe the same air with him, or look upon deep waters or the star fields of the blue sky. A never-ending night, without thought, without dreams, awaited her who had no soul and could not get one. The merrymaking lasted long after midnight. She laughed and danced on despite the thought of death that she carried in her heart. The prince kissed his beautiful bride and she toyed with his coal black hair. Hand in hand they went to rest in the magnificent pavilion. A hush came over the ship. Only the helmsman remained on deck. The little mermaid leaned on her white arms and looked to the east to see the first red hint of daybreak. For she knew that the first flash of the sun would strike her dead. Then she saw her sisters rise up among the waves. They were as pale as she, and there was no sign of their lovely long hair that the breezes used to blow. It had all been cut off. We have given our hair to the witch, they said, so that she would send you help and save you from death tonight. She gave us a knife. Here it is. See the sharp blade? Before the sun rises, you must strike it into the prince's heart, and when his warm blood bathes your feet, they will grow together and become a fishtail. Then you will be a mermaid again, able to come back to us in the sea, live out your three hundred years before you die, and turn to dead salt sea foam. Make haste, he or you must die before sunrise. Our old grandmother is so grief-stricken. Her white hair is falling fast, just as ours did under the witch's scissors. Kill the prince and come back to us. Hurry. See the red glow in the heavens. In a few minutes the sun will rise and you must die. They gave a strange deep sigh and sank beneath the waves. The little mermaid parted the purple curtains of the tent and saw the beautiful bride asleep 
with her head on the prince's breast. The mermaid bent down and kissed his shapely forehead. She looked at the sky, fast reddening for the break of day. She looked at the sharp knife and again turned her eyes towards the prince, who in his sleep murmured the name of his bride. His thoughts were all for her, and the knife blade trembled in the mermaid's hand, and she flung it from her, far out over the waves, where it fell the waves were red, as if bubbles of blood seethed in the water. With eyes already glazing, she looked once more at the prince, hurled herself over the side of the ship into the sea, and felt her body dissolve in foam. The sun rose up from the waters. Its beams fell warm and kindly, upon the chill sea foam. The little mermaid did not feel the hand of death. In the bright sunlight overhead she saw hundreds of fair ethereal beings. They were so transparent that through them she could see the ship's white sails and the red clouds in the sky. Their voices were sheer music so spirit-like that no human ear could detect the sound, just as no eye on earth could see their forms. Without wings they floated as light as the air itself. The little mermaid discovered that she was shaped like them, and she was gradually rising up out of the foam. Who are you towards whom I rise? she asked and her voice sounded like those above her, so spiritual that no music on earth could match it. We are the daughters of the air, they answered. A mermaid has no immortal soul, and can never get one unless she wins the love of a human being. Her eternal life must depend on a power outside herself. The daughters of the air do not have an immortal soul either, but they can earn one by their good deeds. We fly to the south, where the hot poisonous air kills human beings unless we bring cool breezes. We carry the scent of flowers through the air, bringing freshness and a healing balm wherever we go. When for three hundred years we have tried to do all the good we can, we are given an immortal soul and we share in mankind's eternal bliss. You, poor little mermaid, have tried with your whole heart to do this too. Your suffering and your loyalty have raised you up into the realm of airy spirits, and now in the course of three hundred years, you may earn by your good deeds a soul that will never die. The little mermaid lifted her clear, bright eyes towards God's son, and for the first time her eyes were wet with tears. On board the ship all was astir and lively again. She saw the prince and his fair bride in search of her. They gazed sadly into the seething foam, as if they knew that she had hurled herself into the waves. Unseen by them, she kissed the bride's forehead, smiled upon the prince, and rose up with the other daughters of the air to the rose-red clouds that sailed on high. This is the way that we shall rise to the kingdom of God after three hundred years have passed. We may get there even sooner, one spirit whispered, Unseen, we fly into the homes of men, where there are children, and for every day on which we find a good child, who pleases his parents and deserves their love, 
God shortens our days of trial. The child does not know when we float through the room, but when we smile at him in approval, one year is taken from our three hundred. But if we see a naughty, mischievous child, we must shed tears of sorrow, and each tear adds a day to the time of our trial. The end. And that is where we close the book on this episode of Down to Sleep and on The Little Mermaid, for that is the end of the book. 